Okay, hello. Welcome to the August 2023 The Nutritionist webinar. I'm Marianne Fezenden, Educational and Academic Liaison for AMTS and your host for this series. In our continuation of the topic of heat stress, we're we are on which we are focused this season, we're happy to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Dahl today. Dr. Dahl is a Harriet B. Weeks professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida. Gainesville, where he previously served as chair of the department for 12 years, acting as liaison between the university, livestock producers, and allied industries in Florida. While chair, Jeff guided the department's elevation to number nine in the world for dairy and animal science, according to the Center for World University Rankings. Dr. Dahl conducts applied and basic research with direct impact on dairy production. His Specific research interests include effects of photoperiod manipulation on production and health, the impact of frequent milking in early lactation on milk production, and heat stress abatement during the dry period on cow and calf productivity and health, which is the focus of our talk today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Dahl. We have a real treat because he's doing it live, so I have to stop my share and he's going to take over. Hopefully that'll move move smoothly. Perfect. I think it moved, I think it moved smoothly. Good morning. It everyone. did. You know what you're doing. All right. I'm going to mute and um, take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Marianne, for that nice introduction. And happy to be here with you today to talk about our work <clears throat> around uh, the effects of heat stress during the dry period. So late in gestation on the cow uh, and how she moves through the transition period and into early lactation from uh, in terms of health and production. And then also we're gonna focus on impacts on the calf, which may be um, actually of, of more interest because those are longer lasting effects than those on the cow. So I've got two sort of uh, prongs here that we will uh, focus on. The first one is looking at various aspects of heat stress and late gestation on the cow. Uh, we'll focus primarily on um, milk yield, uh, but then we will also talk a little bit about metabolism, immune function, and a uh, little bit about placental function as uh, perhaps the nexus where we see the effects on both the cow and uh, those on the calf as well. And then we'll switch gears and talk about some of the impacts that that late gestation heat stress is having on the calf, uh, both uh, in utero and after that calf is born uh, early in life and as she moves into the production string as well, uh, because there are long lasting impacts of that heat stress on the calf. So just to set the stage, uh, the uh, place that we do our, our studies uh, is, uh, illustrated here. Um, you can see that this is a, a pretty typical barn uh, for the southeast. Um, be pretty typical actually around the U.S. It's a four-row sand bedded freestall barn um, and the only thing <clears throat> different for us is that we don't have um, any uh, side walls or, or curtains on the sides. It's just a roof over that uh, stall area. So we're going to have soakers that run uh, along the feed line here uh, so let's see if I can get a, a pen and uh, you can see that there are soakers here and then our fans are over the beds. So hopefully the cows will go uh, up to the feed line. They get wet all along their backs and then they go lay down and those fans will then uh, uh, cause that air uh, to move across their backs, pulling that water, uh, that moisture and that heat away as well. We have our fans set to come on at about 21 degrees Celsius, and our soakers are on for a minute and a half uh, every five minutes once our temperature gets to about 22 degrees. <clears throat> so this is where, as I said, we've done almost all the studies that I'll describe to you today. Pretty typical, uh, as I said, of uh, facilities in the Southeast, but uh, I think that that helps um, uh, with the relevance of this to the production industry. So this illustrates what happens when we, we don't cool cows in Florida. Uh, our studies are typically done uh, between the months of June and, and October here in Florida when we experience hot and, and humid weather, hotter and hu more humid than we normally uh, experience. And all I'm illustrating here is that if we don't actively cool our cows, we're gonna set them up for um, 
uh, excessive uh, potential heat stress in those animals. So what we've illustrated here is on this left y-axis, the temperature in degrees Celsius throughout the day. And against the uh, y-axis on the right, we have the percent relative humidity. And you see that <clears throat> in the morning, we'll have temperatures um, typically between 22 and 23 degrees Celsius. And that continues for the first few hours of the day. And then it rises rapidly in the morning to a peak in the afternoon, uh, usually around 30 to 32 degrees uh, Celsius. So not excessive, excessive heat, but hot enough. The killer for us then is the uh, humidity. <clears throat> and we see that the humidity is in the dashed line here. We see uh, essentially 100% saturation in the morning. And that means that it's really difficult for animals to, to get rid of excessive heat they've accumulated during the day. Now our humidity comes down to be sure in the afternoon, but still we're typically at about 60 to 65% relative humidity, even at the, the peak of the, the uh, temperature uh, of the day. So it's really that combination of, of heat and humidity that means that our cows have a very difficult time uh, be, being cool if we don't provide some level of, of active cooling. And by that, I mean shade along with uh, fans and, and soakers in order to cool the cow. Because what we're trying to do is cool the cow, not cool the environment. With this level of humidity, there's no way that we could really effectively cool the air um, unless we used air conditioning, which we're not going to do. And that would just be pulling out relative humidity anyway. So what we're really trying to do is get those cows cooled. And we do that by providing the fans and the soakers. In order to implement our treatment then, what we do is just remove access to fans and soakers. And when we do that, we get an increase in <clears throat> average rectal temperature. In the mornings, uh, sometimes this will be significant, sometimes not, it's always elevated typically about two tenths of a degree uh, rectal temperature um, in the heat stressed animals over that of the cooled animals. In the afternoon, we always see an elevation. And this is going to be in the range of about four tenths to, to five tenths of a degree Celsius uh, elevated temperature in our heat stress animals versus our cooled animals. And while initially that may not seem like <clears throat> an excessive increase in, in body temperature, you have to understand that when we do our studies, what we do is take the cows immediately after dry off and put them onto either the heat stress or the cooling treatment. They stay on that treatment until they calve. And that means with our typical sort of six to seven week dry period, our cows that are heat stressed never have a normal body temperature during that entire time. So they have a kind of chronic elevation of body temperature for approximately six to, to seven weeks during the dry period. Now that wouldn't necessarily be uh, excessive uh, relative to, to what has been done in the industry in the past. It would be very typical. Uh, our cows are under shade, uh, but we have found that even that level of heat stress can have dramatic impacts on the cow and, and the calf, as I'll show you now. So the first observation that we made was uh, looking at the impact of that heat stress on milk yield in cows. And these are data from one of our earlier studies showing um, the separation of milk yield in the cows in the solid symbols. Uh, those are the animals that were cooled during the dry period. And they're uh, compared with the animals in the open symbols that were uh, experiencing heat stress when they were dry. Now, all these cows during lactation had active cooling. They were all fed the same diet. They're all milked at the same times. So the, the only difference in how these animals were managed was what happened before they calved in. The cows that were uh, cooled, obviously fans and soakers were available for the entire dry period. And the cows that were heat stressed <clears throat> had no fans and, and soakers, although they did have shade. And yet there is a very uh, early uh, separation of milk yield, as you see, and that continues for the extent of the lactation. So kind of programs those cows for lower productivity during that following lactation if they've experienced heat stress versus the animals that were cooled. Well, that's one study, but uh, what we really wanna see is consistency. These are all of the data that I've been able to find in the literature and they all say the same thing. 
that cows that are cooled during the dry period make more milk in that next lactation than uh, cows that are heat stressed. So a very consistent biological response uh, in these animals uh, when they experience heat stress, they're gonna have lower productivity in that next lactation versus the animals that were cooled. And there are some other impacts as well that, that we'll talk about. So the basis for this drop in milk production then appears to be a, a direct effect at the mammary gland. At least that's where uh, we, we first looked uh, for this impact. So when we think about the uh, really the, the, the mammary function, it's really a pretty simple equation. It's going to be a combination of uh, how many secretory epithelial cells there are uh, for milk production and the function of those cells. What's their metabolism? How hard they're working? And that's really the equation that uh, leads to uh, milk production. Now, because this impact uh, that we see of dry period heat stress is there from the beginning of lactation and continues on even after the animals have no longer experienced the heat stress, that suggests that there's an effect more on epithelial cell number or on the, the uh, capacity for milk production rather than epithelial cell metabolism. So if we look at then uh, epithelial cell number, again, pretty simple equation, we can have a change in epithelial cell number and increase by increasing cell growth or, or proliferation, or we could slow the loss of epithelial cells. We know that uh, in cows, there is a sort of a maximizing uh, effect early in lactation of, of epithelial cell number before peak milk production. And then after that, we're gonna lose epithelial cells at a fairly constant rate and it follows the decline of the lactation curve. So we could be seeing a slower uh, loss of cells in the animals that were heat cooled versus those that, that were heat stressed. So we wanted to look both at proliferation and cell loss. And we did that by taking a series of mammary biopsies during uh, the dry period and into lactation in order to, to quantify impacts on proliferation and, and, and cell, cell death. So what's shown here are the um, impacts on uh, cell proliferation. This is at day minus 20 um, after the animals are dried off. So as I said, we typically have a six to, to seven week dry period. So this is about halfway through the dry period that we took these biopsies and we looked at the um, proliferative uh, capacity in the epithelium. So what are gonna be uh, secretory cells? The stroma, which is the connective and supportive tissue uh, around the epithelia, and, and the total. And what we see, this is, is um, this KI67 labeling is just an indicator of proliferation. We see that the animals that are cooled, those in the dark bars, have an increase in epithelial cell proliferation. Similar pattern for the stroma, and, and overall, the total cell proliferation is increased in the animals that are cooled relative to those that are heat stressed. So that's uh, pretty strong evidence that there's gonna be greater capacity uh, for milk production in that next lactation if an animal has been cooled versus the animal that was heat stressed. But of course, we also had to look at the other half of the equation, which is cell loss. And so we looked at that as well. Um, here we have mammary epithelial cells. So this is just the epithelial fraction, we didn't see changes in any other fractions uh, either, uh, but we're looking at apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And what we observe on that same day, that day minus 20, is that there's no difference. That's not a significant difference in the rate of apoptosis between the animals that are cooled and the animals that are heat stressed. There's an increase in both groups around the time of calving. Uh, that's not uh, unknown. Uh, that has been shown before that there's a lot uh, of uh, changes going on in the mammary gland, obviously, uh, at the initiation of lactation. So that increase was not unexpected, but there's no difference again between the two groups. And there's no difference as we move out into lactation. So it's not that the cows that are heat stressed are losing cells at a faster rate, and that accounts for this difference in mammary uh, output and uh, productivity. So that's at the cellular level. 
We've also looked at this uh, moving up in terms of the, the structures, the collections of uh, epithelial cells that are um, going to be combined into um, alveoli. And when we've looked at alveoli number, uh, we see that cooled animals have an increase in alveoli number relative to animals that are heat stressed. So very consistent at the cellular level and at the structural level uh, in terms of mammary capacity being increased in animals that are cooled during the dry period versus those that are heat stressed. So some of the practical questions that <clears throat> have arisen as we've worked our way through uh, this, this uh, area of, uh, uh, of research, now, do we have to cool cows for the entire dry period or can we cool them perhaps just for the close-up period? Uh, will that have an impact on uh, this uh, effect on milk yield and health? What about heifers? First calf heifers coming into their first lactation, obviously no dry period in those animals. So is there any advantage to cooling them prepartum uh, as they move into their first lactation? So we've looked at, at both of these uh, questions with regard to the uh, timing of the cooling. Um, th the, these are data from a study that we did where we essentially split the dry period and heat stressed or cooled animals for one half or the other. Uh, so to set this up for you in, in panel A and, and panel B, what we have are the rectal temperatures and the respiration rates for cows that are um, cooled in the solid bars or heat stressed in the open bars for the first half of the dry period. So we went about three weeks um, of cooling or heat stress in all the animals, um, well, in half of the animals, just as we normally set up our, our, our studies. And then about halfway through the dry period, we took half of each of those groups and we shifted it to the other treatment. So now we ended up overall for the study with four treatment groups. We had animals that were, we'll look at panel C and, and panel D. We have cows in the solid bars that are cooled the entire dry period. Cows that are <clears throat> in the open bars that were heat stressed for the entire dry period. And then our switch group with the um, lines um, going uh, uh, up, uh, up and down uh, in the cool HT, that's the animals that went from cooling to heat stress. And then the horizontal lines, the HTCL, the animals that went from heat stress to cooling. And if we look at respiration rate and, and rectal temperature, <coughs> they did exactly what we would expect it. Cows that were heat stressed had an increase in rectal temperature and respiration rate. Cows that were <coughs> cooled had lower values for rectal temperature and respiration rate. And when we shifted animals to the opposite treatment, they responded as we would have expected with an increase in respiration rate and rectal temperature in the cows that went to heat stress from cooling versus the animals that went from cooling to heat stress. So all this was kind of as expected. What we didn't expect were some of the impacts on gestation length and, and dry period length. So we know that animals uh, that are heat stressed during the dry period are going to uh, tend to calve in earlier than animals that are cooled. And that's illustrated here. If we look at the blue bar uh, versus the, the orange bar, the cows that were cooled had a longer gestation length and hence a longer dry period length than the animals that were heat stressed in the orange bar. Usually we're talking about three to, to four days uh, dif difference on average in the animals that are heat stressed uh, versus those animals that are cooled. But when we looked at our two heat stress, uh, uh, our two switch groups, we found that they weren't different from the animals that were heat stressed for the entire dry period. So their gestation length was reduced relative to animals that were cooled the whole time and their uh, dry period length was also reduced. It wasn't any different from the animals that were heat stressed for the entire time, but they were all lower than the animals that were cooled the entire time. So they seem to be responding to heat stress at any point during the dry period, um, similarly to if they had heat stress the entire dry period. And that actually um, is uh, borne out when we look at milk yield 
in the four groups of animals. So the top line, the open squares, are animals that were cooled for the entire dry period. The uh, open circles sort of at the bottom line uh, as we start looking at it from week one to five after calving uh, are the animals that were heat stressed for the entire dry period. And then the two triangular uh, symbol lines are the animals that were our switch group. And while initially it looked like they may be intermediate to the heat and cool groups, they ended up not being any different at all from the animals that were heat stressed for the entire dry period, but they were lower than the animals that were cooled for the entire dry period. We think that this uh, probably is uh, due to uh, effects on, on placental function. And we have another line of inquiry. We're looking at uh, placental activity. Uh, the placenta is not just there to uh, sort of provide support for that developing fetus. It's also uh, producing many of the hormones that are going to influence mammary development. And we think that this reduction in uh, essentially placental activity, because the animals have a shorter gestation length, may be influencing um, the overall output uh, from that placenta, which influences mammary growth. But the bottom line, at least for us, interpretation is that cows that experience any heat stress during the dry period are going to suffer a reduction in output in the, the next lactation versus those animals that are uh, cooled. So then moving on to first calf heifers, <clears throat> in this case, uh, we took animals off a of pasture in the summer in Florida and brought them into uh, our uh, freestall facility about 60 days before they were due to cat. So a little bit longer period uh, of treatment here. Uh, you can see in, in panel A that there was a rapid separation and re respiration rate in the animals that were uh, heat stressed. So they came into the barn, had shade, but no access to fans and soakers. The animals in the blue line were our cooled group. They had access to fans and soakers and had a reduction in their respiration rate relative to the heat stressed heifers. Similarly, body temperatures uh, declined uh, in um, the animals that were cooled, uh, but the animals that were heat stressed had an initial drop, but they uh, had a separation. Their body temperatures, particularly as we got closer to calving, were um, separated from the animals <clears throat> and elevated from the animals that were cooled uh, for that final 60 days uh, of gestation. And then looking at milk yield in those animals in the first lactation, we see that very similar to the mature cows, heifers that are cooled coming into their first lactation actually have improved milk output versus animals that are heat stressed. And that's persistent uh, 15 weeks into lactation. I think those those numbers are not going to come together uh, anytime soon. So we see uh, that uh, regardless of whether it's really a, a dry period or not, it's that late gestation effect that's influencing that reduction in, in milk yield in animals that are heat stressed late in gestation versus the animals that are cool. So very consistent biological response. Doesn't matter if it's the first lactation or the fifth lactation, we expect to see the same uh, increase in milk output in the next lactation in animals that are cooled late in gestation versus those that are heat stressed. So it's difficult to get the number of animals that we might need for a controlled experiment to look at some of the other aspects, uh, particularly those around health events and around reproductive performance uh, with dry period heat stress. So we took a little different approach here. Um, these are data from uh, a large commercial dairy that we work with here in Florida. Uh, in the case of this farm, it's very consistent management, high level of management, very consistent feeding. Uh, and we simply went back and, and looked at records of cows that were dry on this farm during the hottest months of the year, June, July, August, versus genetically similar group, all managed the same, that were dry during the cooler months of the year, December, January, February. And just to, to tell you that the management of dry cows at the time on this farm was that the animals went on to pasture, very little shade, 
So the cows that were dry in the hottest months obviously would have experienced significant heat stress versus those that were dry during, during the uh, cooler months of the year. And what we observed, uh, similar to our controlled studies, was that the animals that were dry uh, during the hotter months of the year had lower milk output than the animals that were dry during the cooler months of the year. Ends up being about 600 liters, uh, so roughly two liters a day in that next lactation uh, if they were dry in the hotter months versus the animals are dry during the cooler months. In terms of disease then, um, if there's a zero, it means they didn't have the disease. A one indicates that they did. And in the case of mastitis, uh, respiratory disease, and retained fetal membranes, we saw that there was an increase in the animals that were dry during the hotter months of the year relative to the animals that were dry during the cooler months of the year. So all of those diseases were elevated in animals that were dry during the hotter months versus the cooler months. The only disease that we saw that was higher in the ones dry in the cooler months were the digestive diseases. Um, that included uh, a, a diagnosis of ketosis based on uh, keto strip uh, urine dips in those animals. And we think that's primarily what we were seeing is that there was a little bit more ketosis in the cows that were dry during the cooler months versus those dry during the hotter months of the year. But it certainly didn't lead to higher incidence of other disease, and it didn't slow them down from a productivity standpoint. And then looking at reproductive performance in this same study, um, cows that were dry during the hotter months of the year versus those that were dry during the cooler months of the year had uh, poor reproductive performance, the high uh, level of reproductive performance overall, but it was still reduced in the cows that were dry during the hotter months of the year versus those that were dry during the cooler months of the year. Um, and the other thing to remember about this is that the cows that were dry in the cooler months of the year were at a higher level of productivity. We were also trying to get those cows bred during the warmer months of the year. So there are some acute effects of heat stress that might have been influencing performance. And yet they still outperform the cows that had been dry during the hotter months of the year. So nothing uh, negative uh, on reproductive performance uh, with uh, dry period cooling. So that's kind of a quick summary, uh, mostly production related information uh, in the cows that were heat stressed during late gestation versus those that were cooled. Uh, and we've done quite a bit of other work, but really uh, these are the, the high points in terms of, of production. We're gonna alter uh, mammary development in those cows and we program them for poor production in that, that next lactation. So now I wanna shift gears a bit and talk about the effects on that developing calf, uh, both early in life and uh, as she moves into the uh, production string and really through her first few lactations which we've accumulated some information on now. So first observation was birth weight. And of course, we already talked about the fact that cows that are heat stressed in late gestation tend to calve in earlier. So we expect them to have lower birth weight uh, calves, uh, and that's been shown before. Certainly, we were not the first to, to show that. Uh, but consistently in our studies, we see a reduction in birth weight in the animals that are um, heat stressed during late gestation versus the animals that are cooled. And uh, what hadn't been looked at before was how long this difference in, in body weight persists. We initially looked at the uh, weights of these animals at weaning, and we see that uh, heat stressed uh, dams have uh, smaller calves at birth. Those calves are still lower body weight at weaning versus the animals that were cooled during late gestation. Um, doesn't seem to be an effect uh, so much on body growth. Um, it's more of a persistence of that lower birth weight effect in the animals that were heat stressed versus those that dams were cooled. Perhaps a greater impact, though, is the impact on immune status. So these are data from our, our first sort of observation uh, of uh, immune status. We looked at total circulating immunoglobulins in the animals that were born to a cooled dam in the solid symbol at the top, 
versus those that were born to uh, a heat stress dam in the open symbol, sort of at the, the lower line, dashed line there. And we see that from the first day of birth, so all these animals receive colostrum within four hours. It was uh, about four liters of colostrum, good quality colostrum. And yet there's already a separation in terms of circulating immunoglobulin. And that persists through the first month of life. So the apparent efficiency of absorption, again, they all got the same volume of colostrum. We knew that it was good quality colostrum in terms of Ig content but the absorptive capacity was reduced in those animals that were born to a heat stress dam versus those born to a cooled dam. So one of the sort of limitations of this study though, was that they all got colostrum from their own dam. So if there's something else in the colostrum besides the Ig that influences Ig uptake, that could explain uh, these differences. So we went on to, to look at that by um, setting up uh, two experiments within a study. Uh, in the first experiment, we had calves that were born to heat stress cows and those born to, to cooled cows. And instead of getting their dams colostrum, they got colostrum from a large pool of good quality colostrums. They were all fed the same volume of colostrum uh, from the same source within the same time frame. Um, so here we're looking for an effect on, on the calf itself, trying to eliminate any uh, variability due to colostrum. And then we took the colostrum that those two groups of dams produced, the heat stressed cows and the cooled cows, and made two additional pools of colostrum and fed that to calves that were born under thermoneutral or, or cooled conditions. So now we're looking for an impact of either heat stress colostrum or cooled colostrum. In terms of the impacts in that first experiment, uh, we see that uh, at birth, so at day zero, uh, there was the difference in body weight that we expected. Because remember in this first experiment, the calves were born to a heat stress dam or a cooled dam. That difference in body weight persisted through weaning, just as we'd observed previously. And we also started to get some other information on the, the, what type of, of tissue growth was, these animals were experiencing. We we're looking for a gross indicator of lean tissue growth, which is going to be associated with height. And we see that at two weeks of age, there's already a separation in terms of withers height, and that persisted through weaning as well. So the animals that were born to a cooled dam not only heavier, but it looks like there's more lean growth in those animals. And that's consistent with some, some other data that we have looking at uh, metabolic uh, activity in these two groups uh, of animals. So just as we would have expected, uh, there's that difference in, in body weight. And when we looked at immunoglobulin uptake, it was as we had seen previously. The calves that were born to heat stress dams had lower apparent efficiency of absorption relative to the calves that were born to a cooled dam. And this is despite the fact that all of these calves got colostrum from the same source. So this is pretty strong uh, indication that it's an effect on the calf itself rather than any impact on, on colostrum. But of course, we wanted to confirm that. So we did the second study, the second experiment, where we looked at for an impact of colostrum. Remember these calves were all born under thermoneutral conditions. So we didn't expect, nor did we see any difference in birth weight, weaning weight, any of those uh, variables that we looked at. We also did not see any impact of the source of colostrum, whether it was from a cooled cow or a heat stress cow on immunoglobulin uptake in these calves. They all had the same apparent efficiency of absorption, regardless of the source of colostrum. So that confirms that it's an impact on the calf itself rather than an impact on uh, colostrum. And it means that it's going to be difficult or impossible really to, to reverse this once the calf is born. We can't just give them more colostrum. We can't get it to them quicker there's a deficit in their capacity for immunoglobulin absorption that is uh, induced by the animals uh, experiencing heat stress when they are late in gestation. 
and we can't reverse it later on. So we wanted to then take a look at some of the longer term impacts of this reduced growth of this reduction in immune status early on in, in life on those animals as they uh, went through life uh, and entered the production strength. So in order to get to the number of animals that we needed, we had to combine data from a number of our studies. These are all the uh, references for the, the, the cow studies that generated the calves uh, that whose records we then went back and looked at. We have very consistent uh, sort of management of our, our heifer facility. When we look at patterns of um, the variables that we examined, uh, they were all consistent from year to year, but we really just needed to build up the number of records in order to, to uh, have power to uh, determine whether there are differences or not. So we combined records uh, across these five years. We looked at some, some early life uh, effects in bulls, but primarily we were interested in what was happening in, in the heifers that were born to these cows on various studies. We ended up with 40 plus heifers in each group, uh, those from the cooled versus the heat stressed uh, dams. And we followed those animals uh, through the first uh, three years uh, of life uh, in this initial uh, data set. So when we look uh, at birth weight, just as we would have expected, there's a reduction in birth weight in the calves that are born to heat stress dams uh, versus those that are born to, to cooled dams. Um, Gender was significantly <clears throat> uh, uh, effective on, on this. Uh, we had uh, bulls, as expected, were heavier, whether they were heat stressed or, or cooled, uh, uh, than, than heifers. Um, but the, the primary uh, outcome here is that heifer or calves that are born to a heat stress dam, lower birth weight than those born to, to a cooled dam. Again, we then started just tracking the impact uh, on the heifers. Shown here uh, is body weight at uh, birth. We see the separation in the heifers. We see that same thing at weaning around two months of, of age. And we see that that persists through the first year of life. So just about to puberty, uh, we still saw that the animals that had been born a year or so earlier to a heat stress dam had a lower body weight relative to their herd mate that was born to a cooled dam. So there's a persistence in that uh, lower body weight uh, up to a year uh, of life anyway. So the impact on immune status, uh, particularly on survival in the herd, we looked at this, um, this focus in on this uh, line, uh, the fifth line there, the heifers that left the herd before puberty. And we see that uh, the ones that left primarily due to, due to sickness, um, were uh, increased in the animals that had been born to a heat stress dam versus the heifers that were born to a cool dam. So that's an indication that that lower immune status is leading to long-term effects on, on calf survival in, in the herd. And then of course, since more of them left before puberty, uh, in the heat stress group, we had fewer of those animals that actually made it through their, their first lactation. So long-term impacts of being born to a heat stress dam um, and they're negative in terms of those calves leaving the herd sooner and not making it through the, the first lactation. Reproductive performance, uh, very low numbers of animals obviously here that we were able to, to look at. Um, no real difference in the age at first AI, but uh, the calves that were born to cool dams seem to have improved uh, reproductive performance. And we've gone on to look at this much more extensively. And uh, these uh, sort of uh, indications hold that the calves that are born to cool dams actually have uh, improved reproductive performance relative to those that are born to a heat stressed dam. And then looking at first lactation records, Calves that, that two years earlier had been born to a heat stress dam made about four liters a day less milk on average than their herd mates that two years earlier had been born to a cooled dam. So significant long-term impact on productivity of being born to a heat stress dam versus being born to a, a cooled dam. So 
knowing that uh, these animals are all sort of genetically similar, there's there's no difference in when they calved, any of the management after they calved. We were looking for reasons that might explain this beyond the, the heat stress effect. <clears throat> so uh, thinking back to our growth data, uh, we knew that the calves were lighter at birth, they're lighter at weaning, they're lighter at a year of age. We thought perhaps the calves that had uh, experienced heat stress in utero in that first lactation, we know the animals are still growing. Uh, perhaps they uh, you know, were gonna catch up in terms of body weight and then from the second and greater lactation, they would recover and uh, have the same level of productivity as, as their herd mates. So we went back and looked at uh, body weight and that didn't explain it. They had already, from a, from a body weight standpoint, experienced compensatory gain because there was no difference in body weight at the time of calving. So between one, year one and year two of life, that compensatory gain had already occurred, such that there's no difference in body weight gain through that first lactation. So we've since gone on and, and looked at a larger number of animals across three lactations, and it tells the same story. So here, a uh, larger number of, of animals, the blue line are the animals that were from a uh, cooled dam, the red line or orange line are from a uh, heat stress dam. They're at about two plus liters lower uh, milk yield in the first lactation. Similar in the second lactation, as we move to the third lactation, that doubles. Uh, obviously we're losing animals along the way. Um, so, but it, it shows that this is a persistent effect of in utero heat stress on that animal's productive phenotype such that they are a lower producing animal for the rest of their life in the herd. And in fact, we have now gone on and looked at those animals' persistence in the herd. So panel A uh, shows um, about 150 animals uh, that we have tracked in our herd uh, over time. And we see that uh, the blue line are the animals uh, that are from cooled dams and the orange line are animals that are from heat stress dams. And you see that the orange line is always below the blue line. They are leaving the herd sooner on average if they were born to a heat stress dam versus being born to a cooled dam. And when we look at the, the total data set, it's about a year less in the herd on average for the animals that are born to a heat stress dam versus those born to a cool dam. And what is perhaps more, more of a problem is the fact that they seem to pass this on to their offspring. So panel B are the daughters of those daughters of heat stressed or cooled dams. And it's a similar pattern. The animals that are the granddaughters of the cows that were heat stressed in late gestation leave the herd sooner than animals that are from grand dams that were cooled in late gestation. So there's a transgenerational aspect to this programming those animals to be of a lower survival phenotype ultimately. So this is uh, not just programming them for that first lactation for early life. This is programming a poorer performing, less healthy phenotype for life with late gestation heat stress. So in summary, late gestation heat stress or dry period heat stress, negative impacts on the dam. During the dry period, we see indications of placental dysfunction. They're definitely gonna have lower dry matter intake. We didn't talk about that, but we see lower intake and there's impaired mammary growth. And that leads to that cow producing less milk in that next lactation. Multiple studies, we've looked at this between four and five liters a day less from those mature cows. The bigger potential problem though, is that that calf that's developing in utero, when she experiences heat stress, she's gonna be a lower birth weight, poorer uptake of immunoglobulins, lower weaning weight and survival rate. And when she goes into her first lactation, she makes less milk. 
and up to three lactations, she makes less milk. So we think that that in utero heat stress is actually programming that calf to be of a lower productivity phenotype, lower health phenotype. We've got some indications, well, a lot of indications now that that's uh, caused by differences in, in DNA methylation, which is consistent with a lot of the fetal programming work that's been done uh, with other insults. And uh, that also then persists at least into the F2 generation. So really long lasting impacts of a fairly short term insult of heat stress in late gestation. So with that, I will uh, turn things back over to, to Marion and uh, be happy to take any questions. All right, thank, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, everybody will get back to some pictures. I'm going to go back to sharing my slide set. Jeff, as I explained um, when I emailed, if what I'll do is make it so that if you want me to go to a specific slide to assist with answer to some questions, you just just tell me um, what slide to go to. I'll make it so that you can see where I am. Okay. All right. So um, as I said, we're going to follow with questions shortly. If you've not already done so, please enter any of your questions that you might have in the chat or question window. As a reminder, today's slides will be available as a PDF document for download from our website on the page that will also contain the link for the recording. And you can expect an email notification of availability within the next few weeks. Additionally, I do convert the audio to podcasts. You can find those under the podcast tab on our AMTS website or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Our next webinar will be on the 14th of September with Odiram Escobar, the manager of Agricola Anacali, LTDA, the world's largest robotically milked dairy cattle, dairy in Chile. He will be sharing his experiences formulating for very large robot herds. Please note this webinar will be delivered in Spanish. We will provide simultaneous translation into English. And you may be asked to select a channel when you log in, or it may be just something that you do. I'll do a little bit of research before we get that up and going. All right. I want to thank my co-hosts for the, the day. Um, a little bit of conflict on time on um, appointments this morning. So I'm very pleased to have um, Dr. Martin Traxler from LaTeX join me. Elena was unable to join. Um, and the other what of other hosts you see are the afternoon webinar co-hosts. Um, Marty, I'm sure will have some good questions and good experiences to relay as he is formulating in Mexico. Um, these are a list of our wonderful sponsors who allow us to pay our speakers and help justify my time commitment to the project. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm and Hammer Animal and Food Production, hashtag Science Hearted, the Canola Council of Canada, discover the amazing val value of canola meal at canolamazing.com, Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives, and Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are the Forage Analysis Labs of Dairyland Laboratories with affiliates around the world, and Adiseo, Ruminant Nutrition Solutions to Ensure Animal Performance. Our bronze sponsors are Aminomax, Virtus Nutrition, Balchem, The Milk Group, and Barron's. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide, and we hope you consider them in your formulation decisions. Now, I'll go to this view so that, Jeff, you can tell me where you, you need me to go to, um, and I can quickly move to that slide. I want to welcome very quickly um, my coworkers and, and bosses, Lynn Gilbert and Tom Taluki. They've joined us in the, the co-hosting panel. And I know that Lynn and Tom have a, a meeting to go to shortly. So I'm gonna ask Tom if he has questions, comments, or discussions, and hopefully he'll come back after, after that, if that suits. Hi, Tom. I'm still processing. There's a lot of stuff here that I was just smiling at the whole time. Um, 
Yeah. No, I, I'm still processing. So Okay. No. Well, maybe your meetings will be short and you'll be able to come back in and we won't be done yet. Mm. Um, <laughs> Marty, hi. How are you? You put me on the spot there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have some questions if you guys all want to process. Lynn, you usually don't talk. Do you, do you have any questions? I do have a question. Excellent. Um, Jeff, I was wondering about your talk was great. Thank you so much. It was really informative. Um, my question is more about the colostrum. I know that it seems as though I'm wondering if the colostrum has something to do with, with, with heat stress and cold stress and programming the calf. Um, I don't know if that's really an answerable question, but it just and seems like that. I'm yeah. going to butt in to Lynn and say there is a question um, from that. Eva that um, asks about heat stress versus cool cows. Does the effect of heat stress have on colostrum volume and quality? Mm -hmm. So I think those two questions can get rolled together. Yep. So uh, to take the one in the, in the question, uh, an answer uh, panel first. Uh, the the quality of the colostrum, if we look at immunoglobulin content, really doesn't seem to be affected by the heat stress, but we do see a reduction in volume. So on average, we don't see a difference in quality Ig content from heat stressed animals, but we will see a reduction in, in volume. Um, that may have something to do with some of the impacts we see on colostrum volume as we move into the fall in a lot of places. Um, I, that's been looked at along with photoperiod effects, and I think that a lot of those environmental impacts are probably driving some of those, those reductions in volume, but not really an effect on, on uh, Ig content uh, in, the, in the colostrum itself. In terms of the, the question from Lynn on, on programming, uh, we've looked at this uh, much more extensively. Uh, we actually did a, a slaughter study to look at the impact on um, uh, the capacity for immunoglobulin uptake. And when we look at the um, intestinal um, differences between these animals, it appears that the calves that are born to a heat stress dam actually have an acceleration of, of gut closure. So that seems to be a process where that initial enterocyte layer uh, turns over very quickly early in life. As it turns over, we get much more um, functional type junctions between those enterocytes and that essentially blocks uh, the, the capacity for large macromolecules like immunoglobulins to, to pass intact. So that process is accelerated in the animals that are heat stressed. And so that's one of the reasons why we can't really reverse it after they, they hit the ground. So yeah, they are programmed, but they're programmed uh, to have essentially much more rapid gut closure uh, if they've been heat stressed versus the animals that are cooled. And then that I think is part of the fact that those animals don't, don't persist as long. They just have a lower immune status. Thank you. Yeah, sure. thank you. Um, did you, have there been studies done, is there any relation or correlation by breed? So we have not looked at, at different breeds. All of our studies have been done with, with Holsteins. Um, you know, I, there may be subtle effects. Um, certainly some in, indications are jerseys are a little more heat tolerant. Uh, but I don't think that we're going to change the, the overall biology. I think that for the most part, we're going to see very similar effects in, say, a Jersey versus a Holstein with some perhaps uh, subtleties uh, of the overall impact. Okay. Um, and, in, and were there any studies on calf res resiliency post-birth with relation um, specifically to heat stress. I know there was some, you talked some about disease resistance, but are um, stressed in utero more, um, yeah. suffer more during heat stress occasions as calves? Actually, calves. actually, it's the opposite. We have looked at that at maturity. Um, their response to an acute heat stress is uh, improved in the animals that were heat stressed in utero. And that probably has to do with some 
impacts, again, uh, programming impacts on skin and um, other heat dis dissipation mechanisms in those animals. The trade-off is that those animals are lower producers. So it's hard to completely separate the two, but they, if they were heat stressed in utero, they do tend to have improved performance or, or they, they respond less to an acute heat stress event at maturity. Okay. Um, I see another I, question in there. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to that one. Um, the the question for half calf and heifer um, embryo donors, are they the same uh, with regards to heat stress? So I'm trying to understand the question exactly. Is it that you're wondering if we put a if we put an embryo into a cow and she was heat stressed versus the ones that were cooled? Um, I think that the the embryo would their response would follow the dam's treatment. I was I'm I'm wondering if he meant the re reverse. Um, if you took an embryo out of a heat uh, a typically heat stressed or heat stressed area, and they um, how would that behave mm -hmm. within a non heat stressed cow? Yeah, so they're going to probably have some of those uh, methylation and other environmental impacts already, uh, having experienced heat stress uh, at early in life. Um, the other thing to remember, you know, that those calves that are heat stressed in utero are born with all of the potential embryos that they're going to have. And so mm. already influence that next generation directly because of the impacts of in utero heat stress. So I think that if I took a heat stressed, a calf from a heat stressed dam and took embryos from her, they would be similar to that calf versus reversing the effect. Okay. All right. Thanks. Marty, did you think? Um, yeah, I guess I, I, I have a question then can be asked. Um, Jeff, that was a, a very good presentation. Um, I'm interested in a little bit, you talked or discussed a lot about the impact on, on milk production following calving or even in the, in the uh, daughters. Uh, have you looked at, at feed efficiency between these groups? Um, yeah, that, you're getting lower milk production, but are are they are they eating less? Are they eating the same? What happens to feed efficiency between the, these two groups that are heat stressed or cooled? So I can tell you, at least early in lactation, the animals that are uh, cooled uh, in that the, the cows, uh, we've looked at intake in those animals, and we don't see differences in intake. So that would suggest that the cows that were cooled when they were dry have better feed efficiency because they're making more milk. Um, but, but we have not measured it far enough out in the lactation, uh, to, to really make a lot of claims, uh, early lactation for six to eight weeks. Yes. There doesn't seem to be a difference in, um, the, the intake, uh, between the two groups, but as we move out, I mean, I don't think we've changed the uh, metabolism of those animals per se. And so, they're going to have to have higher levels of intake. Whether that would then reduce their efficiency, I, I don't know. I think that they're still going to tend to be more efficient uh, if the, they were cooled in late gestation versus the animals that were heat stressed. In terms of the daughters, we have not looked at that. We have not had the opportunity to, to look at uh, relative differences in, in efficiency of the, um, the daughters at this point. Mostly that's a numbers game. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, Tom, you're still here. Any thoughts, questions? He could be not listening. He could be on another meeting, not listening. Okay. <laughs> um, I am. I am looking to see if we get any more questions, or Marty, if you have any any other topics to discuss, because I think I think Tom's on the other meeting. Um, otherwise, we can plan to reconvene tonight. Okay. Uh, I can ask another. Perfect. Um, 
it's kind of related to what what Lynn was asking earlier or the first question um, regarding the the absorption of of uh, IgGs. Is there and I may have asked you this a number of years ago, Jeff. Um, can that can that can there be an impact if colostrum feeding is done earlier? Um, during the during periods of heat stress. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't think so. Um, and the reason I say that is that we get our calves fed pretty quickly uh, after they're born. I mean, I say four hours, but that's really the absolute maximum. We usually have them tubed within an hour uh, that they're going to have their colostrum, and we still see these differences. Uh, it, it's just a, a physical difference, a developmental difference between the calves that were heat stressed in utero versus that that are coming from cooled dams. So I, I don't know that we're going to be able to get to the same uh, level that we see uh, in terms of absorption in the um, heat stress calves versus those that, that are cooled even with more rapid feeding. I don't think giving them a larger volume is going to do anything. It just, they, they just don't have the capacity to, to take it up. All right. Okay. Um, so this, this might, the person who is asking says they might've missed it. What months were the calves born in the, in the study? Yeah. Like I said, the, uh, the studies that we do, we typically are going to run those between June and, and October. So most of the calves are going to be born in that July, August, September range, potentially into, to October, um, but they're all in that case kind of controlled in terms of the cooling versus the heat stress. The calves in the one study where we fed colostrum from a heat stress dam or from a cool dam, those animals were born in December and January here in Florida. So during our, our cooler months of the year, thermoneutral months. Um, so this, this is a lot of, this is hypothesizing. And wondering if um, if this is as things get warmer and warmer, and we have more heat stress situations, do you foresee that there would be any um, advantage into moving embryos around with regards to sort of the the whether it was a stress dam, a non stress dam, or if if um, calves actually that are going to be in stressed areas heat stress prone areas do better if they did receive stress that even though they produce less, do they produce, um, would they be better than a calf that has not experienced heat stress as a mature cow? I don't know. It's like I said, it's all, I've been thinking about this and I'm not very clever. So. Yeah. I, I think that there are a couple of things to, to think about there. I don't, I don't believe that there is any advantage to having calves that are heat stressed versus those that are cooled in our current sort of intensive management. What we need to do is manage more of our dry cows appropriately so that they're not experiencing heat stress in order to avoid it, because then we can have the productivity and health in the dam and the productivity and survival in the calf. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, with our, our management, we should be able to, to cool those animals effectively. That's going to be, I think, the most straightforward way to deal with it. And then that you know, sort of addresses the moving embryos around, that type of thing. One thing that I would say that people want to consider is as we move more towards um, sort of selective breeding and breeding with sex semen in the upper half of the herd versus the lower half, when do we want to sort of produce our heifers? When do we want to produce the animals that are going into the beef string? And you know that gets into looking at um, heifers coming into the herd. And I understand that that you know you want a fairly steady sort of supply of that. But if there is any movement that we would um, have more of our beef calves born in sort of late summer into the fall versus our heifers that are going to come back into the herd, I think that there'd be an advantage there. 
And and might that sort of situation come to a, a sense of animal welfare with regards to what is the best best th it, even though we want to steady supply, perhaps moving forward we have to consider that that perhaps isn't the healthiest for the animal. Is that a con a consideration? Well, <clears throat> I will say that you know when we start to look at things like. Uh, sort of longevity and persistence in the herd. And we have done that recently. And I'm going to be talking about that at the next Discover conference in, in October. You know, we just went back and looked at records uh, of uh, longevity. And when we look at animals that are in their fifth, sixth, seventh lactation, it's about two thirds to one third. Two thirds of those animals are born in cooler months versus one third. So there is definitely a, a, a longer term effect uh, on those animals even surviving in the herd. And as we get more of a, I think, an appropriate push to extend the longevity of our herds, then again, that's another area we might want to investigate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, Marty. Jeff, unless I get any more questions, I'm going to thank you so much. I think um, I, Michael Hutchins was was in here earlier. I don't know if he's still here. And he said, thank you. Excellent with new data. Um, and we will adjourn and we'll reconvene um, six o'clock Eastern time tonight. Okay. All right. Thanks thank, much, you. Marianne. thank you so much. It was fantastic. And I'll talk to you later. All right. Today, we are joined by a nice collection of co-hosts. Bill Prokop from Dairy Innovations is here representing both himself and Elena. Marty Traxler from La Tech and our distributor in Mexico is here again. He asked some questions this morning and he came back for the question period this afternoon. Paula Torillo is our Argentinian co-host with the wonderful edition of Paula Alanis, who does her translating. And also Tom Taluki and Lynn Gilbert have joined the webinar to field some questions. And I imagine all of them have had some experience trying to formulate in heat stress conditions. As I wait for questions in my window, I'm going to pop it over to... Um, Let's see. Paula has a question, and it's always a question whether Paula's mic's going to work. So I'm going to give you a shot, Paula. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Paula. Hi. So uh, may I start with my question? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. I was so, okay, I was thank so you. pleased to see you with a question that I'm just like, go ahead, Paula. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dahl. It was a, a very interesting presentation. So the first uh, question we have is in, in the, during the entire dry period, is it better to refresh the cows in the first part of the dry period or in the second part, according to your data? Well, I would say that our data shows that it really doesn't matter um, if they have heat stress in either part of the dry period, they're going to suffer. Um, and we think that that's probably due to, uh, you know, the, the, the proliferation later in the dry period is really dependent on what's happening early in the dry period during involution. And we think that heat stress has negative impacts on both of those phases. So we see that animals that are heat stressed early in the dry period are going to have some negative impacts on involution which really set the stage for the subsequent pr proliferation. But animals that are heat stressed late in the dry period are going to have a depression in terms of the proliferative phase. So I think that if we have heat stress at any time during the dry period, we're going to suffer the consequences. Okay, perfect. Uh, Marian, yes, I prefer to continue, but it's Yeah, to that's you. fine. Okay. That's fine. I don't. Think okay. So. The, the the second question uh, is related to the um, the um, the the ITH the the you have to H -I. reach. Uh, yes, sorry, in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. The THI. Yes, the THI. Um, do, do you have a, a specific number for one day, or is it more important uh, if they are? 
uh, in a cycle of great uh, THIs during, for example, two or three days in a row? Yeah. Well, we don't we don't know exactly is how I'll start my answer. But um, you know, rather than thinking about THI, what we have tried to do is come up with some ideas as to how we can get a cow sort of based indicator of heat stress. And we analyzed data from a few of our studies and came up with a number of about 61 breaths per minute as being the respiration rate where animals are starting to show increases in temperature and are starting to show the negative impacts of heat stress. And so rather than focusing on THI per se, um, I think that it's important to use that information to uh, the respiration rate information to determine when or how much heat stress animals might be experiencing. So if we have cows that are over 60 from a respiration rate standpoint, they're becoming heat stressed. And as that increases, they're only getting more and more heat stress. If we're below 60, then we can be confident that those animals are not experiencing heat stress. But the, the total amount of time that they're heat stressed, I don't think is, it, it's, a, it's not a all or none. It's, it's not as if they have 15 days of heat stress and suddenly that causes the issue. I think any amount of heat stress that they have late in gestation is going to have some negative impact. It's just that the longer and longer they experience it, the worse they'll be. Okay, and and regarding this, uh, your answer uh, is it important to uh, if the nights are cool or not? Well, certainly we know cows get rid of heat at night, and so if the nights cool off, then that should improve their overall um, heat stress sort of strain that they would have on them, but. I say that knowing that our nights here in Florida cool off. They might go from 92 degrees Fahrenheit to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, which seems like a lot. And yet because of that increase in humidity, they're not able to get rid of that heat. And so cooler nights should have a positive impact, but it really is how far down they actually cool. And are they getting cool enough to get rid of some of that excess heat. And in most cases, I think that we really need to have active cooling in order for them to, to really get cooled off, unless we're in a very um, arid environment where we might go down to a temperature low enough to maintain thermal regulus, regulation um, in those cows. Okay. Uh, Paula, thanks. thanks for those great questions questions, let me know when you have some more. I know you usually get a lot of um, participation. Uh, Bill, I'm going to, I'm going to see if you would like to um, share some, have some thoughts or any questions. Sure. I'd love to. <clears throat> Jeff, it dawns on me. The last time we spoke was in Hoa, China at the same conference. I don't think I've spoken to you since then. So we haven't spoken since COVID, because <laughs> so I think that was right before it, right? Or, yeah, exactly. A few months before it, yeah. A few months, yeah. Um, great job. Um, certainly, uh, you know, so relevant. So I guess I'd like your thought on, on a couple of things. You know, you brought up the dry matter intake at the towards the end of the talk. So obviously, these heat stress cows suffer throughout this um you know, the stress, we know there's many factors that are probably related to inflammatory markers, you know, acute phase proteins that are causing this depression of intake. And you also mentioned about the placenta being the, you know, the organ um, for mammogenesis in terms of hormones. Are any of these studies or have any of these looked at the protective effect of feeding essential fatty acids um, during the dry period? Um, uh, just, you know, from numerous uh, aspects of, uh, mm -hmm. and I mean both omegas, not, not just one as mm -hmm. a package. So she has the resources to um, deal with the inflammation that's taking place that, you know, we don't see from the outside. Yeah, we have we have not done that, that yet, Bill. Um, we have done some work with um, other 
additives, uh, particularly omnigen. Um, we're looking at uh, choline right now. Uh, so I can't speak directly to the, the fatty acid uh, question uh, right now as to, to whether that would have a, a ameliorative effect or not. Um, certainly, we will get some positive responses to things like omnigen, particularly early in, in lactation. Uh, but uh, I hesitate to sort of suggest to people that we use that as a, 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 a the only thing that we do, right? I think it's best to, to have uh, multiple, uh, to, to get cows cooled first and then look at some of these other factors. Have you have you done, um, you know, acute phase protein monitoring then through these studies? I'm just curious whether Omnigen or whatever other additives to see what impact it may have had on, you know, um, haptoglobin or SAA or whatever. Yeah, we uh, it's funny you should ask me that because my technician asked me today about uh, um, some data that we well, some some samples that we have uh, and she is uh, validating that uh, assay at at the moment. <laughs> so we'll have those uh, those answers for you here soon. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Bill, thank you. And certainly if you have any other points or points of discussion as we come back around, just um, interrupt me. I have a question in the window. Um, any research in the work to understand why calf uptake is less when heat stressed is it is the absorption block gut wall closed or can they not utilize the colostrum ig as well yeah actually we did a, a slaughter study with with calves uh, that had been heat stressed or or cooled uh, in utero and looked at that very question and what it looks like uh the well the, the data indicate that those animals that are uh, heat stressed in utero actually have an acceleration of gut closure. So it appears that the, the sort of first layer of enterocytes there in the, in the gut wall when the animals are born, um, more leaky, uh, able to uh, 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 allow for Ig uptake. And what we found that and, and again, the, the, the idea is that as that layer of enterocytes turns over, early in life, the tight junctions become tighter and that limits the ability to take up <clears throat> larger proteins like immunoglobulins. And what we found was the calves that had been heat stressed in utero have an acceleration of that process. They are already um, sort of <sighs> having tight junction formation, which limits their capacity for immunoglobulin uptake. <clears throat> Okay, th thank you. Um, Marty, thanks for joining this evening. And and Tom, I'm going to I'm going to ask both of you if you have comments or questions. I know you were a little gobsmacked this morning. Um, and you've had all day to think of things, which I'm sure you have. Anybody? They're on, they're not unmuting. That's resistance. Okay. I am going to ask, um, while they're thinking about whether they're going to talk, I'm going to go to Paula. She has a question. Hi, uh, yes. I, I have two more questions. Perfect. Uh, the, the first one is um, about the, the calf. If you call the dry cow, but then you don't call the calf, is she having a, a lower milk yield uh, like the daughter from the heat stressed cows? So all of the effects, <clears throat> I think I understand your question, Paul. All the effects that we're talking about are due to that in utero environment. So after calves are born, there are certainly negative impacts of heat stress on their growth, but I am not aware of any indication that you have these long-term negative impacts on those calves. So that programming occurs in utero, not after the animals is born. Okay. Uh, and the other que question, if we make a, or increase the growth of the heifer, the, the heat stressed uh, daughter, the daughter from the heat stress cow. If we make them grow faster, 
to reach the, a similar weight of the other uh, heifers, are we going to avoid the, the lower milk production? Yeah, I, I don't think so, but I don't have any data to support that thought. But what I can say is that all of our animals are going to be, they weren't limit fed, you know, they were, they were fed to, to what we would expect them to need for their, for their normal growth. <clears throat> but we have other indications that they are metabolically different. And I think that those calves that are from heat stress dams are going to have a greater propensity to put down um, fat versus the ones that are born to the cool dam. So that sort of hint of that that I gave you with the uh, leaner growth, the taller growth in those calves born to cool dams versus heat stress dams bears out when we do insulin challenges, when we do glucose tolerance tests, that those animals tend to, that are heat stressed tend to have greater um, propensity to move those calories into fat. And so I don't think that just feeding them more is going to do anything except end up with a fatter heifer. And of course, there are negative impacts of that after the animals uh, are born uh, in terms of mammary development. So it may actually exacerbate the problem. Paula, this is Bill. Can I jump in for a second? Yes. Um, yeah. Because uh, I want to segue into because the question I have ties right into that. So when you show the dis, the divergent lactation performances of heat stress versus non heat stress, those those girls are eating the same amount of dry matter intake, or are we seeing an animal that's less efficient? Or I mean, I'm just curious. Or is it not consistent across the studies? You know, where do they Ball. We haven't we haven't looked at that yet, Bill. I mean, in terms of getting these cows into um, Kalen gates and, and getting individual intakes on on the heifers as they come through our, our program, uh, we have not not been able to do that. Um, we do have um, a lot of information on on feed efficiency, and so it it sort of uh, sparks a thought. Uh, I may be able to go back to some of our records and, and look at that uh, specifically uh, in some of these animals, just because you know, they, they've been in our herd for a while, obviously, we've been correct, collecting records uh, on these animals for the last 12 years or so. But, there, I, but I can't answer it directly as to whether they're less efficient or not. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking at the slide ahead of um, the slide that I've got highlighted, and it if their body weight is um, not really affected, that would seem to look just from a look at it. It looks like maybe they would be less efficient to get that drop in production. Is that a yeah? But we just don't an know assumption. What, but we but don't, you don't know, know what their intake is. Right. Yeah, that was my question because and let, let's assume the intake is the same. Is there any in the slaughter studies? Is there any evidence of permanent gut damage from the heat stress that might lead them to be less absorptive and you know and possibly less efficient because they were you know tight cells or whatever? They just they just have damage and they're not going to be as effective, not necessarily unhealthy, but not as productive. Sure. Yeah, we have not looked at that specifically bill and our slaughter studies are limited to animals that would be slaughtered at birth or okay. at so we haven't done we haven't done older animals gotcha right. thank you for letting me interrupt by the way paula um i see you uh, i see you've unmuted yourself do you have i i did because you know first i had to create the idea wouldn't it be kind of cool if we could just uh you know, maybe breed these animals uh, so that they don't have uh, during heat stress. But then it got me thinking, Jeff, have you gone back and looked at any of the data where, or have you looked at your own data to see if there's also a difference in uh, the productivity of, of these resulting calves uh, dependent upon the heat stress uh, conditions of the DM at around the time of, of conception and in the first trimester of pregnancy as well. Because there is a little bit of data out there that would suggest um, 
there would be issues there, but I don't think there's enough to really say anything unless you know stuff. Yeah, I, we're probably thinking of the same couple of studies, uh, and it looks like yeah, they were. So all of the animals that are going to be heat stressed at that time are going to not be our lactating cows. Our lactating cows are going to be cooled when we're trying to get them rebred going into the second and greater pregnancies. But heifers uh, that are heat stressed around the time of conception, uh, there are indications with large records analysis that those animals are going to be um, hampered in terms of their productivity in, in the first lactation at least. Um, so yeah, that that's true, but it would only be for those first calf animals, not necessarily then for older animals because they would typically, now I understand it's going to vary uh, in terms of geographic location, but they're going to typically be cooled uh, during uh, gestation. Uh, so we can do some management things then from breeding thinking and, and maybe uh, selective use of sex semen. To, uh, Ex to exactly. Absolutely. We talked about that this morning. Um, you know, if I'm breeding the top half of my herd to sex semen to generate heifers, I don't want them delivering in August, September and October. Yeah. Um, we're to have those heifers born. And if we're if I don't have good heat stress abatement. Uh, then I want to have those heifers born at another time of the year. And so, you know, that's going to lead to potential issues with when animals are kind of coming into the string. We want to have a similar number every month, but, you know, there may be other ways to manage around that. Yeah. Are yeah. you, are you aware of um, any differences in studies with beef animals as to whether they were heat stressed and, how they do it, how their efficiency of gain is. Yeah. So most beef animals, of course, are bred seasonally. And so it, it, it's difficult to really tease that out uh, of those kinds of studies. And they're not going to be bred year round, but it could. you know. But like dairy, I'm thinking dairy on beef or beef. Right. And so that's dairy, something yeah. that I think we're going to be able to do in the future is look at uh, what's happening with those crosses that are coming out of our dairy herds, because now we're going to have uh, a much more consistent supply of those animals across the year and look for impacts of heat stress, for example. And, you know, ultimately it may be that we actually want those beef calves to be born under more heat stress conditions, because if our data in the dairy animal is correct, then they're going to have a greater propensity for fattening versus mm -hmm. the animals born in cooler times. Cool. Um, Tom, Bill, Marty, Paula, any other questions? I've got oh, one. Go ahead. Oh. Can you hear me? I'm, yeah. Okay, okay. I had to fool around with the car CarPlay settings to get my unmute ah. button to work. <laughs> um fancy ass guy using car play <laughs> yeah well i could have sat this session out um i appreciate you anyway, coming marty <laughs> anyway i have more of a more of a practical question um uh, for jeff right now um he's familiar with the farms in torreon and where i'm where i'm working Absolutely. and the systems the systems are very different. Um, so would you have any guidance as to how many times or how long dry cows should be taken to the cooling, <laughs> cooling areas and, 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 and mechanically cooled? Yeah. I mean, I saw that when I was there the last time, Marty, and, and it seemed to be working very effectively. There were a lot of farms we went to that had adopted that. Um, and it was varying between three and six times a day. I think some of them told me that they were taking the cows up, getting them wet. They go back to the dry lot and cool off. Um, you know, uh, okay. I, I don't what? know that anybody, I don't know that anybody's looked at a difference between two and six times, but honestly, I think, as I said before, this is all on a spectrum. And so the more, <laughs> the cooler we can get those animals, the better off we're going to be. Sure. Um, now the, the the lactating cows will certainly go between anywhere from six to nine times a day and have five and a half to six hours accumulated cooling time 
Um, and depending on the farm setup, uh, there may be only uh, a couple of hours in between each milking in which uh, dry cows can be brought up and, and cooled. So I was just kind of curious about what you what your thoughts might be on that. Yeah, I think any cooling they can get them is good. And the more they can get them cooled, the better. Sure, sure. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Sure. Thanks, Marty. Um, Tom, Bill, Paula? Paula, go. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I had a comment. Uh, here in Argentina, we have similar systems where we have to cool the cows, uh, taking them to the holding pan and, and soak, him, soak them. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we measured the um, vaginal temperature with a small device, I don't remember its name. Yep. They you put a little they, uh, thermometer into a cedar, a blank cedar. Yep. Yes. Thermocrone. Thermocrone. Yep. Yes, uh, uh, but they they lowered the the temperature, but uh, in one hour and a half they reached the same uh, previous temperature, the high temperature again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's to my point that the more times we can get them cooled, the better they're off they are. Yes, and, and, and here it's, uh, it's a bit di uh, difficult because the, the holding pan is uh, most of the time with the lactating cows, obviously. Sure. It's so, busy. <laughs> it's busy, yeah. Um, any, anybody else with any other questions or comments? So, Jeff, what's the biggest reason producers in your neck of the woods don't invoke more heat mitigation or, 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 or are they the pinnacle of, you know, following your lead? Uh, I'm guessing they're frustrated. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, is it is it availability of water, what to do with the water after they, because having managed dairies, I know what a pain it is to have lagoons fill up with cooling water, um, mm -hmm. you know, or lack of electricity, which is a problem in some areas where they're on a grid and they can only get so much juice. And I'm just curious, what's the, what's the excuse? Yeah, I would have to say that, you know, most of our producers have, uh, given up on excuses and are actually cooling their cows, cooling the dry cows as well. Um, I'd say it's probably fairly infrequent that I would come across a producer and, you know, it's not like we have a ton of them, but they're mostly larger and they're going to make the investment in getting those dry cows cooled uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I understand the, the water issue. We have plenty of water here, but we've got to be good stewards with the water that we have. And uh, the more that we put through our system, the more potential we have for that going into groundwater and other areas with right. higher levels of nitrates or, or phosphorus. So we're looking at some of these newer systems that um, rather than coming on what I'll say dumb systems that just come on every five minutes uh, yeah. and spout out water, whether it's cow and farm or not, um, these, these soakers that, only go on when a cow's in front of her. Yeah, no, no we, cow, no water. Yeah, yeah. and we've a uh, small study. We did it last year, uh, had pretty good response on the, uh, you know, how long they persist in the barn and how effectively they are used, you know, long-term. I don't know. We've got a big study that I believe I was told yesterday is about to be funded to, to look at that exactly in a commercial setting. Uh, but our indications are that the cows that were, um, you know, we had three groups, sort of our standard system for cooling on every five minutes, whether there's a cow there or not, these smart soakers and um, cows that were heat stressed. And we looked at the total water used on a per cow basis for each of those pens. And that total water included the cooling water that was coming out of the soakers and the water that the cows drank. And what we found was the sort of standard system, used the most water for sure, kept the cows cool. The uh, 
system, the smart soaker used less water, kept the cows cool just as effectively. Uh, and the heat stress cows used the same amount of water as those with the smart soakers. It's just that it went through the cow rather than on her back. And so mm. she was not cooled off, even though her water consumption or the total water consumption uh, was the same when it was That's going through cool. her. Yeah. Yeah. What's so that has very cool. for what, where that water's going. What's the temperature of the water that she's drinking on average? And I'm just curious, you know, to what's coming out of the, the well. Uh, 60, he, 70? Yeah, it's going to be higher. Uh, and I noticed that because, you know, I'm used to, I grew up in the Northeast and the water that came out of the tap was cold. Uh, the water that comes out of our tap here is not. I'm going to estimate it's in more of that higher 60s uh, sort of range than cooler yeah. water we'd see um, from well water up north. Hmm. Okay, Paula, another question? Yes. Another question. Um, as an indicator of heat stress, uh, do you think it's enough to have the THI or maybe we can sample and, and take a rectal temperature or see the respiratory rate of some cows in the herd? Yeah, I, I would say the respiration rate is definitely the easiest, Paula, and it can be done, you know, on sentinel cows in a pen. You take 10 cows and look at their respiration rate in the dry cow. If she's over 60, she's going to have indications of heat stress. It's much simpler. It's less invasive than taking rectal temperatures. Or, and I think it's probably more informative than, than the THI because the cow is telling us whether she's heat stressed or not. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, anybody, anybody have any else they, anything else they want to offer or ask? If you had to, if you had to make three management recommendations uh, related to this, Jeff, uh, what would they be? Um, cool your dry cows. Cool your dry cows. Cool your dry cows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I get that question, you know, in a little different form. Uh, I only have enough money to cool one group of cows on the farm. Who do I cool? And I say, well, you know, when I started doing this, I said, ah, I kind of hedged my bets. I said, I'd probably cool the early lactation cows and then the dry cows. And now I just say the dry cows because even the lactating cows, you know, it's funny. We've looked at that and the cows that are the most resilient to heat stress are not the ones you'd expect. And I say that based on data that we have looking at heat stressing early lactation cows, mid lactation cows, and late lactation cows. And when we stop heat stressing them, the early lactation cows come back to where we'd have expected them to be. The late lactation cows kind of come back even though they're at a lower level. The mid lactation cows don't, they don't recover they're down for the rest of lactation. So I think that there's definitely a difference in their resilience to heat stress during lactation. Yep. That seems like, if, unless somebody's got a better question, that seems like a really good question to end on. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah. All right. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the great conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, now I think you you can thank you. It's been it has been really fun having it live both times. So I appreciated you doing that. Um, Paula, Paula, see you next month. It's going to be different. I may be talking to you, but before then, um, Bill, thanks for joining. I know you had another meeting. Tom, Marty, it's all great of you to join. And Lynn, um, everybody have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye, Jeff. Bye. So long. Bye, everybody. <laughs>